everybody. This is the first of our chapter four note videos. Um, the first topic we're going to discuss is photosynthesis, followed by cellular respiration. And these are probably two of the most intricate, complex things we'll talk about all year, um, partly because it's a complex biochemical process. Both of them are, actually. Uh, and there's a lot of details, and it's something that's molecular. We don't see this with the naked eye happening. We certainly see the results of it. But, uh, again, there's, there's some pretty intricate details that we'll go through. Um, I'm loving these new backgrounds. I thought it was fitting that uh, since we're going to speak of photosynthesis, that I have a nice fall background behind me. It's a little weird, like around my head, it's all pixely. Like, look at my hands. You can't really see them when they're here. Um, whatever. So let me go ahead and share my screen. We'll take a look at our chapter four notes. Here they are. So photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Um, I like this symbol, the yin and the yang, because the first thing we're going to discuss really is the relationship between these two processes. I think you'll see that they sort of recycle each other in nature, uh, which is a pretty beautiful thing. So first I list a bunch of the objectives really for um, the whole couple of videos that, that we'll spend learning about photosynthesis. Well, like I said, the relationship between these two processes why and how ATP molecules are used for energy in the cell. We're going to look at the anatomy of a leaf and see how it's so well designed to do the job of photosynthesis. Uh, we'll look at the effects of temperature, light, uh, carbon dioxide concentration on the process. We're going to look at the light itself and pigment molecules, which are special molecules, and you'll see why. And then we're going to diagram the process. So. At the honors level, I like to give you a lot of detail. I think it helps you understand the process better than just sort of rounding the edges and making it easier. Um, so we'll make a diagram of really the, the entire process of photosynthesis. So take a look at this. On the top of this cycle, and hopefully you can see that this is a cycle, uh, the top part is photosynthesis. So we have carbon dioxide and water as our reactants. They yield or produce glucose, which is when we say a plant makes its own food, the glucose is the food, and it gives off oxygen gas as a waste product. Now, sunlight energy is the power source, the energy source for photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is an energy storing reaction. So you could call it an endergonic process overall. Basically, the energy from the sun is stored in the bonds of the glucose molecules and other organic molecules. So animals, heterotrophs, consumers, need to go out and eat food. They can't make it themselves, unlike autotrophs, producers, which use photosynthesis mostly to make their own food. Once a cell has food, specifically glucose in it, which you might remember is a sugar, simple sugar, carbohydrate. All cells do some form of cellular respiration, which is the bottom of this cycle. So the glucose is broken down with the help of oxygen. Energy is released from glucose and stored as ATP molecules. Carbon dioxide is a product which we breathe out. Water is another product that we recycle or urinate out. So you can see cellular respiration here on the bottom is an energy releasing process. So you could call it an exergonic process overall. But the relationship between the two, I think, is pretty special, the two processes. What photosynthesis makes, cellular respiration starts with. And what cellular respiration makes, photosynthesis starts with. Photosynthesis traps energy from the sun into food molecules like glucose. Cellular respiration releases that stored energy and then stores it as ATP, which is a more flexible way for the cell to store energy for its immediate needs. So this is a good diagram to get familiar with and to understand. 
maybe to remember and be able to draw from scratch from memory. Uh, you can just see an open-ended question coming along. Describe the relationship between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Something like that. So speaking of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Uh, I like to call it the energy money of the cell because when the cell gets energy, it stores it as ATP. That's like putting energy in the bank, right? Making it deposit. And when a cell needs to use energy, well, it makes an energy withdrawal. It actually cuts apart an ATP molecule to release its stored energy. And don't forget, when we break apart ATP molecules, that's an example of a hydrolysis reaction. I learned about those when we talked about chopping polymers apart. So this energy that's released from ATP molecules is used to power the many endergonic processes that a cell needs to go through in order to stay alive. So here's an ATP molecule. Got kind of a complex shape to it. Um, I want you to focus on these three phosphates. So triphosphate, right, means three phosphates. Notice the first phosphate has a negative charge. So does the second one. Well, you might remember that like charges repel each other. They do not want to be near each other. So that second phosphate isn't real happy that it's attached to the first. The third phosphate has a double negative. And we're bringing that and joining it next to a, her, you know, a, uh, an original double negative situation. So this third phosphate wants absolutely no parts of being on this molecule. So it's the energy from food, the breakdown of food, that forces this third phosphate on. And you can think of that as like a loaded spring now. It's ready to, 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 to erupt and re-release -re all that energy when we cut that third phosphate off. So it's this third phosphate bond that contains the majority of the energy that ATP stores. And so again, it's the energy released from food that sticks it on there, that forces it on there, and then all that energy is stored in the bond. So when we hydrolyze it and cut that third phosphate off, boom, it re-releases all the stored energy. I just wanted to bring this to your attention because we're obviously used to eating food and, and maybe looking at calories and, and so forth. Uh, calories, by the way, are a measure of energy. So a gram of protein yields four calories worth of energy. And these are lowercase calories. Um, you might notice that there's capital C calories on food labels and, and they represent kilocalories. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, and, and these are kilocalories, capital C calories, not to be confused with lowercase c calories, which are more of a chemistry lab-based unit. How about carbs? A gram of carbs, four calories per gram. Now, fat molecules, lipids, nine calories per gram, and that might not seem like a big deal, four, four, nine, uh, but it's more than double for the same gram. If you were to chop off the tip of your pinky that's about a gram worth of material and so a gram of fat contains more than double the energy the stored energy than a gram of protein and carbs or carbs um, you might remember lipids have long carbon hydrogen fatty acid chains but there's lots more bonds to break <clears throat> they're capable of storing a lot more energy um, per unit mass so who does photosynthesis well producers do also known as autotrophs. And because we're talking about doing photosynthesis, these are photoautotrophs. The energy source to drive the process comes from light. Photo refers to light. So plants, algae, like seaweeds, which are not in the plant kingdom, and some bacteria are photoautotrophs. Now there are bacteria called chemoautotrophs that don't use light. They use chemicals as an energy source to make their own food. <clears throat> They're producers, but they use chemosynthesis, <clears throat> excuse me, not photosynthesis. <clears throat> now, consumers, <clears throat> that didn't help, <clears throat> consumers, also known as heterotrophs, are things like us, things like animals. We need to consume food. We can't make it ourselves. Now, I want you to look back here for one second. 
And I want you to realize that autotrophs make their own food. Heterotrophs break down food, release the energy, and store it as ATP. But so do autotrophs. In other words, heterotrophs eat the food, and that's how it gets in the cell. Autotrophs make the food first, but once it's in the cell, we break it down through cellular respiration. Plant cells have mitochondria as well as chloroplasts because chloroplasts are where photosynthesis happens. Mitochondria is where cellular respiration happens. So photoautotroph cells also contain mitochondria so that they can undergo cellular respiration just like us. All right, just a little history as far as the many scientists from many different countries uh, whose work went into, um, I don't want to say discovering, but, but characterizing, explaining the process of photosynthesis. And now here's just the photosynthesis part of our initial cycle. So this would be good to be able to recognize, like on a quiz or a test. You don't have to come up with it from memory, but you should recognize that carbon dioxide and water are the reactants of photosynthesis. And glucose and oxygen gas are the products. And that sunlight energy is input into this process. Remember we said it's energy storing. Photosynthesis is endergonic overall. So again, I would be able to recognize this uh, in like a multiple choice question or something like that. Um, plus it's just good to know what goes in and what comes out. And finally, I think for this video, guys, I like to break things down into simple terms. Um, photosynthesis, I broke down into three easy steps. The first step is to capture sunlight energy. The second step is to convert the captured sunlight energy into chemical energy. And as you'll see, we store that, or we convert the sunlight energy into ATP molecules, which we've discussed, and another chemical energy molecule known as NADPH. It's an abbreviation for a big, long name. Third and final step is to use this chemical energy to drive the endergonic reactions of the Calvin cycle. So that's a, a cycle of reactions that occur, some of which, some of the steps are endergonic and need the chemical energy to drive them. And this is how we make glucose. We take carbon dioxide from the air, that's our carbon source, and we incorporate that carbon into organic molecules like glucose. All right, so that I think is a good introduction into the process. And so stay tuned for video two. We'll go over some more of the preliminary details before we get into the nuts and bolts of the process itself. Let me know if you have any questions.